tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. Remembering 9-11 in San Diego and across the country. The first five minutes you're there, you're looking around like, whoa, and you're just trying to get a bearing on what, what it is. And it was just, you know, huge pieces of metal, you know, bigger than, you know, taller than us. A local firefighter who was part of the recovery tells KPBS about his experience. Plus, California lawmakers pass a landmark bill, its impact on the economy and jobs. But we can't allow people to get sick, and we can't have our youth be so affected. It's a growing public health issue with a string of recent deaths. President Trump says he wants to take action on the rise of vaping. And room to grow. A busy San Diego community plans to add tens of thousands of homes. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Wednesday, September 11th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. On this date, 18 years ago, the 9-11 attacks set the course for many of the conflicts we continue to face. In a moment, we'll show you national and local remembrances. We start with KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman, who talked with one of 9-11's first responders. As soon as I saw the collapse, every firefighter will tell you they're thinking one thing. A lot of firefighters just died. John Wood was part of a team from San Diego that was called on to look for survivors. So we were on a search and rescue mission. So our job was basically to go search a certain sector and make sure that, you know, if we can find any signs of life. Wood and his team were there six days after the towers fell. There was a lot of missing people. Um, and so one of our big things that we found out all these years later thinking about, you know, reflecting on it is that bringing back closure to families was important. There's no room for emotion on those type of missions, so we turn it off again. Now, obviously, you know, it, it's personalized. I mean, imagine having one of your brothers and sisters, maybe ones you hadn't met, but they're in there. And so when you're finding turnouts or you're finding out a piece of a breathing apparatus or two Port Authority officers like we did, that's, that's our family. Wood hopes the memory of what happened is never lost. One of the big things that I always look at is we never, we will never forget, right? So seeing the interviews, the stair climbs, the education of our children, seeing all that happen is so very important. That looks like a second plane. Has just hit. This is the police cruiser that responded to the 9-11 attacks. If you take a look at it, it's here on display at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. It was badly damaged when debris fell from those towers when they collapsed. You can see the windows were broken, the front bumper came off, and the exhibit also includes some debris that was collected from ground zero. Now, you have a chance to come check this out yourself. This exhibit is on permanent display. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Among the local observances, a ceremony this afternoon on board the USS Midway. It was an emotional event. Those in attendance included firefighters from San Diego and National City, as well as representatives from the New York City Fire Department. One of the attendees brought remnants from Ground Zero. It was a way to share what happened with a younger generation. So the significance of the Remembrance Project is more to bring to the younger generation what occurred on that day and to get the message to the younger folks to let them know that uh, it occurred and what items were found uh, there at the site and to continue to remember the folks that we lost. Also on hand, retired local firefighters and members of the Wounded Warrior Project. The pain of 9-11 remains strong, especially in places directly affected. Camila Burnell shows us how the 18th anniversary is being marked in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. In the nation's capital, September 11 ceremonies beginning with a moment of silence. <laughs> President Donald Trump then heading to the Pentagon speaking to survivors and the families of those who were killed there in 2001. This is your anniversary of personal and permanent loss. It's the day that has replayed in your memory a thousand times over. The president also thanking first responders and those who risked their lives for our country. We saw American perseverance in the valiant New York firefighters, police officers, first responders, military, and everyday citizens. Meanwhile, the vice president in Pennsylvania honoring those who died on Flight 93. In their final moments, the men and women, Flight 93, 
work together to defend freedom. And in New York, where the attacks first happened, thousands of names read out loud. Eugene Clark and my uncle, John Patrick Hart. Names that will always be honored and remembered by family, loved ones, and the nation. Camila Bernal, KPBS News. You'll find more of our 9-11 coverage on the KPBS Midday Edition podcast. It includes discussions on the long-term health risks for firefighters who often work in toxic conditions. You can find that at kpbs.org. The lines between employees and freelancers may soon get closer. California lawmakers have passed a bill that changes who is considered a company employee. KPBS reporter Max Rivlin Nadler tells us what's next. The new bill, known as AB5, passed both houses of the legislature on Wednesday, and Governor Newsom says he intends to sign it. When it takes effect on January 1st of next year, companies that rely on contractors would have to make them at least part-time employees if they exert control over how they perform their tasks or if their work is central to how that employer makes a profit. That means that independent contractors at businesses like Uber or Lyft, food delivery workers or construction and nail salon workers would be given sick days, a minimum wage and the right to organize a union under the new law. The bill's author, San Diego Assemblymember Lorena Gonzalez, had offered over the last few months a limited number of carve-outs for professions like doctors, lawyers, and some freelance journalists, but did not budge on whether it would apply to tech behemoths like Uber or DoorDash. Speaking on the assembly floor shortly before the vote, Speaker Anthony Rendon talked about those companies' opposition to the law. It's no secret that the so-called rideshare app companies want to provide rides with driverless cars, but we cannot allow them to pave the way to that future by crushing the dreams and the lives of workers. Following the passage of the bill, Lyft sent out a message to its drivers telling them that the bill would limit them to only driving for one service. Assemblymember Gonzalez countered on Twitter that this was untrue. Uber, DoorDash and Lyft have already pledged to spend upwards of $90 million on a 2020 ballot initiative that would exempt the companies from the law. Going even further on Wednesday, Uber's chief legal officer said the company would challenge the new law in court because it believes the new law does not apply to its drivers, whom the company claims are not a core part of their business model. Max Rivlin-Nadler, KPBS News. First the remains and now the boat. Dive teams were working to recover the boat involved in a deadly fire near the Channel Islands. The incident happened over the Labor Day weekend. Crews are still trying to recover the last of 34 victims. A woman from San Diego is among those who died. The FBI has opened a criminal investigation. Part of that includes searching other vessels owned by the boat's parent company. A cause has not been determined, but today the Coast Guard issued a safety recommendation for boat operators to reduce fire hazards, including not leaving charging batteries unsupervised. Three family members who died in a buff collapse in Encinitas were remembered today on the floor of the U.S. Capitol. Representative Mike Levin's 49th district includes Encinitas. While speaking in the House chamber, he mentioned the accident and how the victim's family is hoping Congress will take action to prevent future collapses. On August 2nd, three women from the same family died when a coastal bluff at Grandview Beach in Encinitas collapsed on top of them. Julie Davis, Annie Clave, and Elizabeth Charles. They were enjoying a day at the beach with family and friends, celebrating Elizabeth's triumph over breast cancer. Suddenly, all three were lost. There is a lot that I would like to say about the government's responsibility to help prevent similar tragedies in the future, but instead I want to use this moment to recognize the extraordinary light that all three of these women brought into this world. I had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Pat Davis, who lost his wife, one of his daughters, and his sister-in-law on that day. Today, Dr. Davis is committed to ensuring that no one else experiencing, ex experiences the same kind of loss that he has. He has called for action from local, state, and federal officials to prevent future bluff collapses, and we stand together in these efforts. Congressman Levin says he's asking for federal funding for storm damage reduction projects in Encinitas and Solana Beach. He says it would help stabilize bluff erosion. 
And Levin is among House members who passed a bill to ban offshore drilling. Voting was mostly along party lines. It's unlikely to go far in the Senate. Back in March, a judge blocked President Trump's executive order to boost drilling off the Atlantic Ocean and Alaska. A new policy for asylum seekers will stand after today's action by the U.S. Supreme Court. A ruling announced this afternoon allows President Trump to deny asylum to those who pass through a third country on their way to the U.S. Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor dissented. We're getting a look at some of the new wall projects going up along the southern border. This is video from Yuma, where the Border Patrol is installing five miles of fencing near the Colorado River. It's replacing a style of fencing that was only intended to stop vehicles. As a result, people could easily pass through. A Border Patrol officer in Yuma describes the barriers and why the agency says they're needed. Behind me, as you can see, we've started construction of five miles of the 30-foot bollard-style wall along the Colorado River uh, that is currently replacing the outdated vehicle bollards that we've historically had here in the past. Uh, so historically, this has been a huge crossing point for both vehicles as well as family units and unaccompanied alien children during the crisis that we've seen in the past couple months. Uh, they have just been pouring over the border due to the fact that we've only ever had vehicle bollards and barriers here that, by design, you know, only stop vehicles. The project in Yuma will be complete by the end of the year. This week, the Trump administration said it's seen a significant drop in the number of people arrested for illegal crossings. That includes the percentage of crossers who are traveling as families. The population of Mission Valley could triple over the next several decades. Tonight, KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen looks ahead to what that means for development. The Mission Valley Community Plan update allows higher density housing near public transit stops. The neighborhood often suffers from traffic congestion and isn't very walkable. The new plan includes improvements to pedestrian and bike infrastructure and aims to allow more people who work in Mission Valley to also live there. City Councilman Scott Sherman represents the neighborhood. He called the plan a good compromise. I think it's a very good plan. It helps implement all the visions that we've had here going forward with the city's uh, climate action plan, city of villages, and our housing uh, crisis, and also turns the river, I think, into an amenity instead of an afterthought. The plan calls for increased public access to the San Diego River, including new pedestrian bridges. And while in the past buildings often faced away from the river, new design guidelines call for developments to orient toward the river. Now, there's one thing the plan update doesn't mention in any detail. What will be done with the old Chargers Stadium? SDSU is in talks to purchase that land from the city and is going through a separate planning process to redevelop it. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. It was sunny today, and it's going to get a bit warmer tomorrow. We're talking about a return of the 80s at local beaches. Marvin Gomez has details in tonight's forecast. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Hope you're having a great day. I'm Aki Weathers, Marvin Gomez. And as we take a look at our satellite and radar during the last couple of hours, not a whole lot to talk about. We've been clear and quiet for the most part. And that's how the weather pattern has been across much of the southwest. As we take you towards the four corner regions there, we've been seeing a couple of showers. But overall, across Southern California, we've been quiet and we've been dry. As far as conditions go into tonight across the metro area, 66 degrees will be the low with partly clear cloudy conditions and the rest of the region staying very similar 61 along Oceanside heading towards Borrego Springs 71 the low tonight Mount Laguna 54 and for tomorrow well sunshine will return for all of us here across San Diego County and temperatures are going to be in San Diego near 78 Chula Vista 78 as well Mount Laguna 75 Borrego Springs triple digits as we take you a little bit inland. As far as conditions go into our Thursday, well, overall, that dip in the jet stream finally is leaving, and we're not only going to have a sunny conditions, but also warmer temperatures as we get closer to the weekend. For Friday, we are going to see the flow of a warmer air from the south. High pressure system will be sitting across the southwest, so we're definitely going to have a brighter weekend. Taking a look at your extended forecast along the coast, partly sunny skies for the next uh, couple of days, a little bit 
is sunny you're heading into the weekend with temperatures in the mid 80s as far as conditions go inland overall we are going to see temperatures climb to the mid 90s as we head into our saturday and that's going to be the case along the desert as well 108 for the high heading into saturday and also across the mountains temperatures will be increasing 75 for thursday friday heading into the 80s with mostly sunny conditions and then saturday will be in the low 80s once again for kpbs news i'm Mackie weathers marvin gomez back to you this next story contains information that may be disturbing to some viewers. It's about a UC San Diego economist who's using economic incentives to stop female genital mutilation in parts of Africa. But others in the field question if the study could do more harm than good. Earlier today, I spoke to iNews source investigative reporter Gio Castellano about this report. Jill, welcome. Thank you. So for your latest report, you analyze a study by a UC San Diego researcher. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. So the researcher's name is Yuri Genizi. He's a UC San Diego economist, and his work has been lauded all around the world. He studies economic incentives and how they can change behavior. And in fact, one of the authors of the famous book Freakonomics called him a genius. But in the past few years, he's narrowed in on this topic that he's really interested in, which is female genital mutilation. It's practiced around the world, but he's specifically interested in studying it in this small ethnic minority community in Kenya called the Maasai. What happens is, and this might be hard to hear, that these girls as young as 10 years old get their clitorises cut with a razor or another sharp object without anesthesia. It can lead to lifelong pain, real difficulty in childbirth, psychological trauma, and other issues. And part of what Genizi has said is he considers this a real human rights violation. It's considered a rite of passage in this community, but it is it is problematic because it's really, there's no benefit to it. And it's only done as a way to keep the women in line in this patriarchal society. So Genizi did this proposal because he wants to offer economic incentives. He wants to pay for these girls' tuition in the Maasai community. And he hopes that as a result, they will not get this female genital mutilation. So since he's tackling an issue that, of human rights, what's the problem with the study? Right, it's a really noble cause, but as you start to dig into the details, you realize that there are some serious ethical concerns here. And that's not only me saying that, but the research uh, review board at the university has rejected this study many times, and ethics experts we spoke to also raised serious concerns. One of those is just that it seems really naive that this San Diego researcher, this white you know, elite professor could come into this small ethnic minority community and change a practice by offering money to them that's been entrenched in their culture for hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, there are concerns that this could actually do more harm than good. If these girls don't undergo this female genital mutilation, they could very likely be ostracized from their community, their families, their friends. They're going to be shunned. They probably won't be able to marry, and there's no way to deal with that. There are other serious concerns about this, too. Like, this is an illegal practice, which means it's really hard to study. If the parents responsible for their kids getting female genital mutilation are exposed, they could be arrested by the Kenyan government, and there's no plan in place for that. So as you start to pick out the details here, there are a number of ways to see that there are real concerns that could lead to serious harm in the community. So what drew you to this story, this human rights violation happening across the, the globe? Why is it important for us here in San Diego to know about what's going on? We wanted to explore how decisions are made by universities and by researchers about what to study and what to do when you're starting to dive into an ethically concerning area. iNewsource investigative reporter Joe Castellano, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. Great job iNewsource is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. A big announcement today by the Trump administration aimed at stopping teens from vaping. It comes amid hundreds of new cases of severe lung disease. Mandy Gaither has more. After officials say a sixth person has died from lung disease related to vaping, yes, sir, the, FDA's on it. Thank the you. Trump administration is taking a step to combat the epidemic. We can't allow people to get sick and we can't have our youth be so affected. 
Under a new enforcement policy expected in the coming weeks, all flavored e-cigarettes other than tobacco flavor will have to be removed from the shelves. The products would remain off the market unless they become approved by the FDA. Manufacturers of tobacco flavored e-cigarettes would have until May 2020 to file for approval by the FDA, says Alex Azar, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services. What we've seen is the data just shows the kids are getting access to these products in spite of our best efforts at enforcement, at retail enforcement. Earlier this week, the FDA issued letters to leading e-cigarette maker Juul Labs warning the company about illegally marketing its product as a safer alternative to cigarettes. A Juul spokesperson says, we are reviewing the letters and will fully cooperate. The e-cigarette company has maintained its products are intended to convert adult smokers to what it described in the past as a less harmful alternative. I'm Mandy Gaither reporting. County supervisors are moving forward with negotiations to return mental health services to Tri-City Medical Center in Oceanside. The plan calls for a 16-bed facility to treat psychiatric patients. About a year ago, Tri-City shut down its behavioral departments due to a shortage of quality staff, low reimbursement rates to doctors, and facility upgrade costs. Mental health is a big part of the discussion over gun violence access to weapons is another. CNN reporter Drew Griffin tells us about how a federal law makes it easy for unlicensed gun dealers to operate. In many states, including Texas, guns are being sold with no background check required, sold in private sales or by repeat sellers called unlicensed gun dealers. And a CNN investigation earlier this year found dozens of criminal cases against alleged unlicensed dealers some who sold hundreds of weapons without any background checks whatsoever, providing criminals, the mentally ill, and prohibited possessors with weapons. Many of these guns can be linked to violence across the country, to murders, assaults, armed robberies, suicide. A lot of the firearms that I've seen recovered in violent crimes have come through the hands of unlicensed dealers. Some get prosecuted. Uh, I would say most do not. In 2017, a gun allegedly sold by a suspected illegal dealer in Nevada was used in the fatal shooting of a California sheriff's deputy. Last year, a gun sold by an unlicensed dealer was used in the slaying of an off-duty police commander in Chicago. And now, in Odessa, Texas, seven people dead, 25 injured, by a shooter with a gun he bought without a background check from a private party sale. Unlicensed dealers selling as a private party benefit from a vague federal law that does not set a limit for the number of weapons that can be sold by a private seller. They peddle weapons on the internet, at gun shows, in parking lots, from the trunks of their cars. Some boast of hassle-free, no paperwork deals. They are in some cases the most unlikely of suspects. A police officer, a Defense Department employee, a DEA supervisor. Members of a prominent farming family in Washington sold guns for years without background checks. Dozens of the guns traced to crimes on the West Coast, including the 2014 shooting of Tarek Aslati, a budding engineer whose career was cut short. And by the time I ducked and tried to run away, the second shot caught me from the back. There are plenty of critics who say universal background checks would not have prevented most of America's mass killings and will not stop criminals from buying guns illegally. But even legal purchases for guns from private sellers do not require background checks, which makes it easy for anyone to get their hands on a powerful weapon. In 2005, 14 years ago, we produced this story showing just how easy it is in Texas for anyone to even buy this gun without a background check. It is a 50 caliber rifle, a weapon of war used by special forces to kill at a range of nearly 2,000 yards with 50 caliber bullets so powerful they can pierce a one inch steel plate. That's where it went in. We found it for sale by a private seller on the internet, set up a meeting and bought it at a suburban home in Houston. The transaction took 20 minutes. Since the time we purchased this weapon with no background check required, there have been three U.S. presidents, eight Congresses, two Texas governors, and though some states have passed laws to ban the sale of the 50 caliber rifle, in Texas, nothing has changed. Criminals, drug dealers, the mentally ill, 
can buy guns through private party sales, no questions asked. Why? U.S. Representative Peter King, a New York Republican, says his colleagues fear the NRA, who have spread fear, he says, that even a common sense universal background check threatens the Second Amendment. We're not trying to take anybody's gun away unless you're a person with mental illness, unless you're a convicted felon. And uh, yet uh, there, there's a fear among, certainly within the Republican Party, that any attempt to regulate the sale of guns, the possession of guns, it violates the Second Amendment and is the first step toward taking everyone's gun away. A universal background check will not stop all mass killings and will not stop criminals from buying guns illegally, but it will close the loophole on these unlicensed dealers selling guns by the hundreds without any background checks because of a very vague federal law. Drew Griffin, CNN, Atlanta. I'm Judy Woodruff tonight on the NewsHour, paying for pain. A tentative deal is struck with a company behind the opioid crisis. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash Evening Edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. Thank you.